Uh, so I'm sitting here with John, um, and we were asked to give an overview about our experience working with continuous water quality monitors. Uh, and as John and I put this talk together, um, we both reflected that we work on a number of monitoring projects that often have very similar objectives. Understanding what the current water quality conditions of a system are, understanding how those conditions are changing over time, and then addressing why those conditions may be changing over time. Uh, best answering those questions begins with collecting data in the field, but answering them really well often requires collecting frequent, high-quality measurements, and that's a task that's really well suited for the use of continuous water quality monitors. So in this talk, John and I will share the techniques that we've used to most effectively deploy continuous water quality instrumentation, and through the talk we're going to focus on collecting or how you can collect high-quality data uh, while reducing site maintenance needs. Uh, so before I begin, there's uh, just two quick disclaimers uh, to make. Uh, the first is that through this presentation, there's going to be a lot of pictures of different instruments being used in our network, but it doesn't apply any endorsement for those products. Uh, and secondly, more relevant to this talk is that um, John and I are sharing experiences that we have working in streams and rivers. So these instruments can be used in groundwater wells or in lakes, uh, but this talk doesn't really focus on deployments in those settings. Um, additionally, um, our experiences are in non-tidal uh, systems, so uh, issues like bioaccumulation, you know, we're not really going to focus on much. Um, and some climates where freezing is a common problem, again, that's not, not really issues that we're going to address specifically through this talk. Uh, so some structure of today's presentation, I'll uh, just begin with a little background about definitions of continuous water quality monitoring, why it's used, how it's used. Uh, we'll talk about uh, our opinions on what makes a deployment effective, what are we trying to achieve when we put these instruments out into the stream, and then talk a bit about the different techniques that we use to deploy these instruments, so how can they actually get into the water. And the final section is uh, going to be uh, some information about uh, techniques that have been used to advance kind of the basic deployment options. So there's some uh, issues at sites such as um, sediment fouling, um, working in really shallow water that you can address by kind of taking these common approaches and expanding them uh, kind of beyond the basic deployment. So there's one message to this presentation uh, that I hope becomes uh, very clear throughout the examples and the slides that we talk through, and that is that effective continuous water quality deployments allow instruments to consistently and accurately co collect measurements with minimal intervention, and the method and maintenance of deployment has a large impact on data quality. So I'll begin with just a little background. Continuous water quality monitors are devices that provide frequent, near real-time measurements of water quality constituents. Uh, so that contrasts from what we think of as traditional water quality measurements, which are made by having someone physically visit a location, fill up a bottle of water, uh, bring it back, do some processing on it, submit it to a lab, wait for results. Uh, and that can be done at intervals uh, monthly, or you can target storms, or you can tire yourself out and go out there every day and do that kind of work. And you can see the record of data that uh, those traditional measurements produce. Uh, this graph shows a time series plot of stream flow in the blue color. And then if you target storm or target uh, monthly events, you get these pink dots representing uh, nitrate concentrations given from the lab. Continuous monitors allow us to fill this record out much more completely. They're used because water quality can change frequently over time, which necessitates frequent, repeated measurements to adequately characterize variations in quality. So you can see now, uh, using an instrument that measures nitrate every uh, five minutes, every 15 minutes, at whatever interval you'd like to set, you can see a lot more of the dynamics in this time series plot of nitrate. So just by the discrete samples, you lose a lot of the variability without having to monitor in stream. And these monitors are being used all throughout the country uh, for a variety of purposes. Uh, this is a map of USGS spring and stream monitoring locations that are measuring uh, at least one continuous parameter. So 
Some of these stations may simply just be collecting water temperature on a real-time basis, uh, whereas other locations may be collecting a full suite of constituents, uh, conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, turbidity. Uh, but the work is being done all throughout the country in a number of different settings. And the use of these monitors is increasing through time. Um, those increases are occurring because the technology is becoming a little cheaper. Uh, where we can measure a broader range of constituents. The applications are being realized about how valuable this work is. Uh, so you can see uh, the number of USGS monitoring locations in 2006. There was about 1,300 stations with continuous data. And through time, that network has grown to about 2,100 uh, different stations. So as I mentioned, there's a large and a growing list of constituents that can be monitored in the field. So just a little overview about what we can do with these instruments. Uh, we can make measurements uh, for constituents that are now kind of thought of as traditional water temperature, conductivity, uh, pH, dissolved oxygen, turbidity. All of those sensors can be stuck on one instrument, a water quality sond manufactured by a number of different uh, companies. Uh, there is more probes that can be stuck on these things, uh, dissolved organic material, ammonium, uh, total algae. There are standalone instruments just to monitor nitrate in the streams instruments uh, that can monitor uh, phosphate concentrations. There are uh, more recently developed fluorometers that are uh, packaged in a way where the instruments can be deployed and left unattended that measure constituents like oil, optical brighteners, and tryptophan, kind of our constituents that we think of as a human wastewater signature. And that list is continuing to expand through time. Uh, one consideration when you're thinking about uh, what instrument will be best suited for your project is that these instruments all have different deployment requirements and measurement limitations. So you should think carefully about which is going to be best to suit your project needs and your site needs. Uh, so some of these instruments can't work in freezing temperatures. Um, some of these instruments need to be deployed at a fixed depth or at a fixed angle. Uh, and some of these instruments are more sensitive to fouling from sediment or bioaccumulation than others. So just all considerations to keep in mind. And to add to that, although uh, you see on the screen a variety of sensors and manufacturers, one consideration in your objective for your monitoring program, uh, if you're monitoring down a well, that should be a consideration, as well as what your overall water quality objectives are. So. As we continue to discuss uh, the water quality uh, installations and fouling, uh, before you even get to the field, before you even consider your installation type, a lot of thought should be put into the consideration of your equipment type, your uh, uh, monitoring frequencies, and just the overall plan for uh, maintaining and operating these sensors. And so, why are we doing all this work? Why is it worth all this investment? Uh, it's ultimately because these continuous monitors uh, advance our scientific understanding of stream processes, uh, stream conditions. There's a lot of uh, emerging applications for these instruments. Uh, just a couple examples is that we can use these instruments to improve our load estimation of various constituents by developing surrogate regression models. Uh, we can use these instruments to better characterize spatial water quality dynamics and temporal variability in a watershed. Uh, we can look at impacts from anthropogenic activities. We can pair these monitors upstream and downstream and look at the effects of an activity occurring. And ultimately, the investment that's made in these instruments, because they are expensive, they take a lot of work to maintain, but we're trying to maximize this scientific output. Uh, and ultimately, that is not, or that output is going to be diminished by a reduction in data quality. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a really strong deployment from the get-go so we can ultimately produce these really quality project products at the end of the project. So what is an effective deployment? What do we mean by uh, an effective water quality deployment? Well, firstly, an effective continuous water quality deployment prevents a loss of data. And it does that by meeting the power, data collection, and data relay requirements of all the instrumentation deployed in stream. So most of these instruments, uh, commonality is that they're powered um, using a solar panel and some sort of battery. We often don't have AC power at some of our remote monitoring locations. 
Uh, they're then hardwired from a monitoring location back to a data logger so that the measurements that are made on the instrument can be stored on the data logger. And then the information stored on that data logger is uh, transmitted to the Internet some way um, via cell modem or with a, with a satellite transmission so that the information is provided in near real time on the Internet so anybody can go in and access and look at the conditions in the stream. One thing to add here, um, in your selection of the proper water quality uh, instrumentation, if you feel that your site will limit your access or if you are having different uh, monitoring inspection time intervals, you might want to consider an instrument that has internal logging capabilities or an instrument that has internal that is internally uh, powered. Uh, majority of our sites, we, we like to get the data in near real time, uh, but to also uh, limit some of the data losses, uh, if there is ever any, we do like to choose uh, instrumentation that has internal logging capabilities as well. So again, just to add here in, in your process of thinking through your installation, thinking through your, your maintenance of your water quality equipment, consider you know, how you're going to power your equipment from the get-go. Consider how you want your data transmitted and then what interval you want that data to be uh, transmitted at. Yeah, and ultimately what John's getting out there uh, and the theme throughout these slides is that we don't want to lose data. And, and that begins with making sure there's power to the instrument, making sure you're recording the measurements, and making sure they're transmitted um, appropriately at the interval that you expect them to be. So another element of an effective deployment is that we prevent the loss of data by minimizing the frequency and severity of instrument fouling. So we're leaving these monitors out in a stream, we're leaving them unattended, so they're going to uh, become uh, dirty uh, from sediment, from debris, from org organic material in the environment, and they require uh, routine servicings so that an individual can come, clean those probes off, clean those instruments off, and maintain that we are collecting high quality accurate data. We also use these servicing visits to address the calibration drift of deployed instruments. So we take out our standards, we measure is pH reading what we expect it to read. If it's not, we can recalibrate the instruments. Uh, we follow specific guidelines for these servicing visits using uh, documentation developed by the USGS um, and there are different criteria for these different constituents to say, okay, if conductivity has drifted or has become fouled by a certain amount or a certain percentage, then we need to remove data from the database. And that's what we want to avoid. The fouling or calibration drift that exceeds these criteria require our measure, measured data to be deleted. So we want to minimize how often that happens. The first thing we can do to minimize the amount of fouling that an instrument experiences during its deployment is to select a deployment location that gets the instrument out into flowing water. Not only does flowing water often uh, contain the most representative water chemistry of the system, but you also you allow uh, the instruments to kind of self-clean. There's, there's less chance that sediment's going to accumulate on the probes and foul your measurements. We want to find a location that places the instruments far away from stream banks, uh, which can erode and uh, foul, the, uh, foul the instruments. And we want to place the instruments in a um, mechanism that keeps them off of the bottom of the stream. Again, we're trying to reduce the amount of fouling that these instruments experience from sediment buildup. And when you're making these considerations, sometimes the best deployment location is not immediately adjacent to the existing stream gauge and requires a separate data logger, a separate power source, uh, but it's an important consideration and it's often worthwhile to make that sacrifice, to find a location uh, that's going to provide the maximum data quality, even if it requires a little bit more effort for the installation. All time that you invest at this point, these time spent on site reconnaissance, results in less data loss and site maintenance over the lifetime of the deployment. So this reconnaissance is a really crucial part of an effective deployment. Um, maybe one of the most important components of a water quality deployment is constant refinement through time. Uh, you know, th this idea of trial and error, that we can make modifications to an existing deployment to reduce instrument fouling. And just a couple examples of that. Um, this is a time series graph of nitrate collected from a continuous monitor. 
where we have data collected through time, and the periods in red are measured data that we have deleted from the database because the instrument was fouled for one reason or another. So we want to avoid these periods of red. We want to maintain accurate, high-quality data through the life of the deployment. So the issue here was that our instrument was deployed in a PVC tube, which ended up trapping a lot of sediment and consistently fouling the nitrate data. So we made a modification to this site, and we removed the plastic case that this instrument was deployed in uh, to, redu uh, to reduce the frequency which uh, it became fouled. So you can see the resulting record here is much more clean. Another example of a site refinement, this is a turbidity record through time. Oftentimes at some of our sites uh, will have a nice big storm event, we'll collect data through the storm, but then as the, um, as the stream recedes back to base flow, fine sediment deposits on top of the instruments, and often we get these fouled turbidity records at the end of a storm event. So in order to account for that, we've installed a number of bilge pumps uh, near our instrumentation that are used to uh, clean off the sands by pumping ambient water across the face of the probe. So that, that can clean off some of that fine sediment that's accumulated uh, on the instruments. So you can see uh, some examples of storms after a bilge pump was installed and a really clean turbidity record. I have a couple more examples and information about bilge pumps later in the talk. Uh, throughout our continuous water quality monitoring networks, uh, we're typically maintaining about greater than 90% of the data that are measured out in the field, which means we have to remove or have lost less than 10% because of fouling or instrument failure. So it's important to consider through the life of your deployment, if you find that you're having to delete out months and months of data on an annual record, it's time to stop and think about how that deployment could be modified and improved because that's, that's not meeting the objectives of why the instrument's out in the field in the first place. In addition to refining the deployment to reduce the amount of instrument fouling that occurs, you're also going to reduce the number of site visits that are needed to maintain that high quality deployment. So another example of um, a turbidity record before we installed a bilge pump not only do you see the, the time series data here and you see periods in red that were fouled, which required uh, the removal of measured data from the database, you also see on this plot blue uh, diamonds that represent the number of times an individual from the office physically had to go on site and clean off that instrument. Uh, this is about a three month inter uh, window on screen here and we had technicians visiting that site about once every other week to defoul the sand. So we installed a bilge pump on this site, and not only did we preserve a better, uh, cleaner turbidity record, we reduced the number of times that an, that an individual had to go out and uh, clean off that instrumentation. Uh, so it's really ultimately a cost savings at the end. We can reprioritize individuals' time so that they're, they're not making drives to go and clean off our instrumentation. And it's important to remember that there's always going to be scheduled visits necessary to properly maintain this instrumentation, but we're trying to mi minimize these unscheduled visits. Uh, you know, the times that we come into the office and see that the records uh, don't look accurate. So, you know what, your day is going to be getting in the car, cleaning the instrument off. We want to have a number of days where the data look nice and clean, and we're just going out on regular fixed frequency intervals. And again, just like we're trying to maintain uh, a large majority of the data that are collected, we're trying to reduce these unscheduled visits. So we find that our deployments that are running really well, we have an unscheduled site visit about less than once a month. So you know, it's another time to stop and consider, can I improve my deployment? Is someone going out there every week, every few days to clean off the instruments? Maybe there's something else that can be done to improve the uh, data quality. As Jimmy and I prepared for this presentation and, and we got to discuss in our common usage of bilge pumps and uh, air compressors to help with maintaining uh, the fouling at locations, one of the key things that continued to arise was the need to uh, uh, make sure that we consider the timing. Um, the use of bilge pumps, just to be clear, is we're using the native water to suck in and flush the in-situ water quality monitor. 
Well, depending on the parameters that you're currently monitoring, you want to ensure that the timing of that is not affecting the water quality uh, measurements. So, for instance, if you're going to be using an air compressor uh, to flush the sand or even a bilge pump, you want to ensure that uh, the water quality monitor has enough time to equilibrate in between those measuring times. So in Metro Atlanta, um, when we've used the bilge pumps, for instance, we record our data about every 15 minutes. So we ensure that we have at least 10 minutes in, uh, before a measurement is going to be taken to ensure that the in-situ water quality sawn has enough time to get back to ambient conditions. Otherwise, when you start using creativity, which please uh, understand that we, we're, we're definitely saying sometimes you have to be creative in your installations to ensure that you're maximizing your instrument, your, your data long, longevity. What we're really saying is that sometimes when you're creative, you just want to make sure that you take the time to factor in all considerations. So if you're going to consider using a bilge pump, also consider that uh, if it's going to affect any of your monitor parameters. So all these things in mind, we've talked about minimizing data loss, minimizing site visits, you know, but there's, there's some additional constraints on your deployments. Uh, you need to place these instruments in a location that accurately represents stream conditions. So, you know, a great deployment location might be right on the side of the channel, but man, if that water chemistry is completely different from the rest of the cross-section, you need to think about it. Is that, is that the right choice for your project to collect data from that location? Uh, we want to make sure that we can collect data during all flow conditions. So streams that are very shallow uh, during base flows, we want to make sure those instruments are underwater and that we're not going to lose them during high flow events. Uh, we want to make sure because there's always routine servicings and site visits needed that personnel can safely and ac easily access the instrumentation, that the instruments will be safe from debris or from vandalism that may, uh, that may be possible around the sites. And then there's always this wild card of additional partner needs, right? You may be asked to put the instrumentation in a set location or the deployment needs to uh, look a certain way. So it's just uh, something else that needs to be kept in mind when you're considering how am I going to get these instruments in the water and collect a really high quality data record. So now we'd just like to step through uh, some more specific examples of common ways that we've deployed our instrumentation and just some details of those deployments on how we've made them very effective for the work that we do. John mentioned creativity earlier, um, and it is a really good time to be creative when deploying these instruments because you have so many options of how they can get in the water. Um, instruments can be deployed off of a bridge on the bottom, uh, on a bracket, on a boom, in a bucket, in a borehole, on a buoy, in a backpack, you have, you have so many options for how you can get these monitors in the water, uh, and it really allows you a lot of opportunity to decide what is the right choice for my site, for my project. Uh, so there is no right choice. You know, there, there's no single recommendation that we're going to make to you today. Um, hopefully, we're giving you some ideas of things to think about and consider so you can make the right choice for your project needs. And one thing we will stress that uh, you having that consideration of what's right for me, realize that streams are dynamic. Um, you may install your, your monitor during the summertime and it works for that season. Uh, don't be surprised that things may occur, something may happen in your basin, your watershed may change. You may have to adapt and change that installation a little bit later in the season after you continue to watch and learn your watershed. So, yes, it, it may start off right, but don't be surprised. Sometimes they will surprise you, and you may have to adapt as you continue to watch your location. So I want to show more detailed examples of some of these deployments. Um, you know, one of them that we use pretty frequently is a suspension-style approach, uh, working off of a bridge, uh, which may be appropriate uh, if the bridge allows you to access a really nice cross-section if the stream is maybe too deep to wade, um, if you can put these instruments in a location that receives light recreational use, uh, the instrument can be hung vertically, well then, then maybe you should think about a suspension style approach. And the way, uh, the way that this works is that we have equipment clamped to the bridge, and an important part of that is that this entire deployment can be possible without installing any hardware or drilling any holes in the bridge. And, and that can be a really important consideration when talking to 
uh, various uh, departments of transportation who don't want you doing anything to their bridges, well, you know, we can clamp instruments in and keep them really safe and not disturb any of the infrastructure. Uh, when we hang our instrumentation from a bridge, uh, we hang it with a steel cable so that the steel cable is bearing the weight of the instrument so that there's no strain on the instrument cable that's also hung with this deployment. The nice part about this deployment is that the instruments can be raised or lowered in the stream uh, so you can keep this instrument away from the stream bed and you can uh, change the height depending on the site characteristics. In this uh, example, we have our instrument deployed inside of a PVC case. Um, it can add some protection so that uh, your instrument isn't damaged by debris. Uh, oftentimes with these PVC cases, we'll have a number of holes drilled in the bottom, which allows sediment to fall out of the instrument uh, and also allows flowing water to continue moving past the probes. And what's really nice about working from the bridge is that if you can access the bridge, then you can retrieve your instruments during a number of different flow events. Um, you know, during these elevated flows, you can see, um, get an idea from this picture that as flow comes up, the instruments usually just get pulled downstream and ride on top of the stream column. Uh, so debris kind of safely passes underneath. Um, it, it's been very effective in a number of different environments for us to use this type of suspension style approach. Um, but there are drawbacks and important things to consider about it. Uh, the first being that uh, you don't want to work from a bridge that has a really small shoulder or a, a really busy interstate. So you want to make sure that your personnel can safely get out to those locations. Um, having a suspension style approach may be a bit dangerous if you have um, a location that receives a lot of recreation. They're not very visible in the water and we don't want anyone getting hung up on the cabling. Um, you can, during really large events, if you really get some nasty debris moving down the channel, um, instruments can become snagged. The cabling is typically susceptible to what gets snagged and can dislodge the instruments. Um, and one creative adaptation I've seen our colleagues make is to install uh, this deployment with a PVC tube running down the length of the cabling so that debris kind of bounces off the deployment and doesn't have uh, as much of a likelihood to grab a cable and pull it along with it. Another deployment choice um, that's worked really well in a number of our environments is placing instrumentation on a rail type system. Um, so if you don't have a bridge to work from or if the stream is too deep to wade, uh, maybe a rail would work really well for you. Um, this is best when your stream banks are not very erosive and uh, conditions at the edge of the channel are representative of the water chemistry. Um, some of our instruments can't be hung vertically, so I'll show you how that works really well on these rails. At the bottom of these rails, there's a cart, and you can add some custom brackets and custom mounts to this cart so that the instruments are installed on it, and then can be moved on the rail using a handle. So you see in this little uh, animation here, you can, uh, someone can stand at the top of the hill and pull the cart up and access the instrumentation. Uh, these rails are all built to a custom length using different uh, sections, different pieces. And we can therefore get the instruments far out into the water to make sure it's in nice flowing water away from erosive stream banks. We can access our instrumentation during all flow conditions, uh, depending on how tall we build these rails. So uh, flow comes up a little bit, we can still get to the instruments, no problem. And like I mentioned earlier, this works really well for those instruments that need to be, um, need to be deployed in a fixed location or position. Um, you can build these brackets so you can add multiple instruments to a single deployment. Uh, you can kind of get creative with these deployments. And something I want to mention, uh, a few of the pictures that I'm showing, are, our instruments are not deployed in any PVC cases. Uh, and, you know, our, our, I've shown these to a number of folks, and, you know, the, the first thing they say is, well, is the instrument safe? I, you know, I don't want to damage these instruments. They're very expensive, and that's a, that's a good concern. Um, but we've found that some of these instruments are just very sensitive to sediment fouling, or some of our rivers just move a whole lot of sediment. So any protective case we apply uh, is really just causing the instrument to foul. Uh, so we lose data, we have to have people come out and clean the instruments off. Um, so what's worked really well for us is that uh, we select a deployment location that uh, is not, you know, right, right in the middle of the channel. So maybe there's some natural protection of some sort of boulder upstream or whatnot. 
Um, but these rails also place the instruments down uh, closer to the bottom of the stream, so big debris kind of floats over top of it. Uh, and we really had good success getting our instruments out of those cases to preserve a better quality record while also keeping the instrumentation very safe. Some drawbacks of this approach are that the uh, rail deployments can catch uh, debris in the stream. Uh, you can see some like leaves and, and sticks hung up on the top of these deployments. Uh, these rails can be uh, more expensive than some other deployment options to purchase and can be difficult to install. Uh, you know, typically, we anchor these rails into the stream bank using signposting, so sometimes you just don't have um, a lot of opportunity to drive a signpost in deep enough to secure the deployment. Um, the rails are inherently putting instrumentation near the stream edge, so you see in this location uh, there's a side channel here and the main channel is over here, so we really wouldn't want to get a rail deployed on the edge here because the chemistry is different than the uh, majority of the channel. Another deployment technique um, is putting the instrumentation in a pipe. So here are uh, photos of, of that type of deployment. You can see instruments are, uh, are lowered into a pipe that runs the full length into the stream column. Um, so this can either be done from a bridge or from uh, locations that are not in a bridge. Um, this can be kind of a, a substitute for that rail style deployment, right? Uh, if those rails are difficult to install or, or expensive to purchase, uh, using a pipe can overcome some of those obstacles. Um, and you see how the deployments submerge the instrument in the stream and protect them in a pipe. Uh, again, I described earlier how you can use some holes in these, uh, in these deployments so that sediment falls out and flowing water moves past the instrumentation. And again, we really want to get these deployments away from the stream bank. So getting a pipe to run long enough into flowing water is really going to improve your, your record. In Metro Atlanta, we use a lot of PVC because we have a lot of debris flow, large trees and things that are usually floating down. Um, but we do, uh, just like Virginia and other water science centers, uh, deploy sawns and monitors uh, outside of the pipe as well. Um, one of the things when we just kind of circling back to that creativity, you see in this picture the holes in the PVC pipe. One of the things that you have to watch in your data is how many holes, the size of the holes. Um, what type of openings really work for your location? So some locations work better with holes. We've adjusted, sometimes we put slices uh, in the PVC, but the idea is that it, we want it to still allow for some protection of the water quality monitor while also allowing uh, as much flow to come through to uh, clean, keep the sawn clean as well as uh, be representative of the entire cross section. But then at the same time, when there is a sediment buildup, you, you want to allow for that sediment and other, other aquatic life, leaves, sticks, and things that are going to come by, you want to allow that trapped debris to be able to flow out as well. So again, just kind of circling back to that creativity, uh, just because we're showing a location with holes in it, your spot may need slices or slits or small holes or just just remember that there's no one correct way to install it. Um, one thing you will see as well, uh, these PVC pipes usually have a pin or so on so a stop at the bottom of them. Um, but we've used a float at the top of it as well sometimes to keep the sawn so that it does at a stable depth within the water column. Again, it, it allows you to be creative. It allows you to meet your data objectives but it also allows you to adapt to the stream conditions. Yeah, those are important considerations. Um, you know, we've mentioned sediment and debris accumulation in PVC cases a number of times. Uh, we're not trying to put passive sediment samplers out in the stream. Uh, and, and sometimes if these pipes are not deployed correctly, they, they can become uh, that way. So you see this is a, a, a photo of a deployment where um, a pipe was laid down near a stream bank that was actually eroding a lot of sediment during elevated flow conditions. And the sun's just kind of sitting down on the bottom here. It wasn't, you know, great flow moving past the instrument. You can almost see the deployment getting buried here on the bottom. Um, so there are concerns with sediment and debris accumulation inside these pipes. Um, they can travel up into the pipe and if, as John described, if the holes or the, or the cuts in the pipe are not made correctly, sediment won't be able to get back out. Um, so, you know, you can consider even if a pipe 
Uh, was, your first, was the first attempt made at that site and the data quality aren't meeting your objectives, what are the other options? Is there another choice to get the instruments uh, out of that enclosed environment and allow, uh, allow the data to, uh, to be better preserved? So this is just another example of a location where some of our colleagues had a pipe deployment and because that deployment fouled very frequently, they're, they're moving to a rail deployment which will keep the instruments a little more exposed. So it's just constant refinement, constant um, evaluation and considering are there improvements that we can make. Another deployment technique is um, using the bottom of the stream bed to secure uh, the instrumentation. So you know, not all sites are going to have a bridge to work from. Some of our sites are very shallow, so we can actually just wade out and retrieve the instrumentation. Again, this works for those instruments that can't be hung vertically. Um, and the nice part about these deployments is that they're rather visually unobtrusive, so they kind of blend in uh, with the environment a little bit more. You can see the instruments on the bottom of the stream bed here, and they're uh, secured to signposting, which is driven into the stream bottom and, and bracketed to those signposts. Uh, we try to keep these instruments deployed at the top or bottom of a riffle to keep them in flowing water. You know, deploying in a pool with stagnant water wouldn't really be your best choice. Um, we keep these instruments in line with flow so they don't grab debris, you know, a little more, uh, um, a little more streamlined, so debris just flows by the instrumentation. And then we uh, usually secure the cabling in with some eye bolts or zip ties or some way just so they're more secure to the stream bed and you're, they're not being grabbed by sticks and debris that move on top of the stream. Again, optionally, these deployments can be modified to use a PVC case as needed. Some drawbacks of this style approach is, well, if there's high flows, probably shouldn't ask anybody to go retrieve the instrumentation. Um, the signposting can trap debris, so you need to consider if um, there's ways to improve that. And then these stream channels can shift. John talked to earlier about uh, dynamic stream environments and changing conditions. Well, some of these really sandy bottoms can change dramatically after big flow events, and this whole deployment can become buried. So in this final section, I just want to put forward some considerations for um, ways to modify these deployment techniques I've shown you so far, uh, the use of um, build pumps and some additional technology that can help improve the sites. Uh, one challenge that can be common in working in different environments is that uh, you're asked to monitor in very shallow water. Uh, and this can be hard because if these probes aren't submerged, then obviously you're not going to measure the data that you're expecting. So the first choice in this project, uh, where we are asked to monitor in stormwater pipes with a very little flow during low, base low conditions, is that a, a thin instrument was deployed. So think back to that early slide of all those instrument choices. Well, for this project, we chose a very slim instrument to keep it in water. Uh, but even that instrument choice alone uh, didn't result in the uh, quality of record that we were expecting. So we see a number of times where the instrument was popping out of water. We had to delete data from the database and keep thinking about how the deployment could be improved. And what was done here was to use a baffle upstream of the instrument to increase depth and submerge the sand in flowing water more consistently. And that resulted in a, a record that we were much more happy with, uh, required much, uh, much less oversight of someone having to come out and clean off the sand and whatnot. So this was a, a great adaptation for this site. Uh, for those sites, um, or, or environments with really frequent fouling. Uh, we talked about it a number of times, uh, fouling occurring from sediment or algal flock or other debris. Um, the use of bilge pumps can be really critical to maintain a quality record. Um, and so you see one of these a little bit more in action here, uh, bilge pumps that are being used to defoul the instruments. John described earlier by pumping ambient water across the probes at some sort of set interval. Uh, so you can see the pump in the back here. Uh, just some tubing used to direct the flow across the uh, face of the probes, and you can see the uh, the water movement that is that is generated when the when the pump runs. Uh, these have been really critical at some of our locations. Um, some sites that have been really tricky to monitor without the use of these bilge pumps um, required manual oversight much more frequently than we were comfortable with. Um, the way that you can trigger these bilge pumps um, varies based on what you have deployed at your site. Um, you can use an existing programmable data logger um, or just a simple 12-volt volt timer. 
Uh, we use these little simple timers at most of our sites. So we just um, we just set two or four times a day. Um, the pump will uh, be provided power. The pump will run for uh, set intervals, just a minute or two. And that's often enough just to reduce the amount of fouling that's occurring on the instrument and clean off that sediment. And we've adapted these deployments for a number of our different deployment choices that I showed you earlier, the, um, the on the bottom or on the rail. Getting these pumps to blow uh, water near the, near the probes has been um, a really important part of maintaining quality record. Um, another uh, modification to some of our sites that's been uh, very helpful is to um, utilize two-way remote communication. Um, and so two-way communication can be used with data logger programs um, to better uh, inform or prevent site visits. And I'll show you a couple of these different applications. Um, and those applications can really be modified to fit your site or project-specific needs. Uh, but some examples are that we can trigger the bilge pump um, at whenever we want from the office, right? So, you know, if the data appear fouled, we can uh, dial in, access the program at a remote location, uh, trigger the bilge pump, and then see if the uh, resulting data record looks a lot cleaner. Um, we can turn off instruments during certain conditions. Um, you know, we had an instrument deployed uh, that during storm events it would foul up, it would actually uh, clog the instrument, so we would use the two-way communication to stop measuring samples during certain conditions. Uh, a really nice part about these is that you can view some diagnostic information about your site. So, um, you know, if there's a location that isn't measuring the way you think it should, if data aren't showing up on the web, uh, before someone goes out to, um, you know, repair that site, you can log in to the, lo to the location, view the error log, see if you can better diagnose the issue so someone knows what, they're, uh, what, they're, what to expect when they get to the site. Uh, another thing that's been really, really neat um, that John uses a lot is to um, use site cameras to visually inspect stream conditions. So I think this is great if uh, you're collecting data during a storm event. You can visually see the conditions at that site uh, and see if that aligns with the data that are being collected in the field. And this has been really powerful uh, for uh, cooperators who are interested to see what's going on at the site, what does their investment look like. So the final couple slides I want to share with you is just some examples of complete deployments, just um, a couple slides of putting all these different pieces together uh, in some of our locations. So this is a monitoring location we have on the James River, which is a very large cross-section where we monitor. It's about 800 feet wide. It's really large trees that can move down the channel. So the first choice we, we um, made at that, this site was to deploy our instrumentation from the edge of the stream in a more protected location where the water chemistry is very representative of the cross-section. Uh, we use a suspension-style approach here uh, where instruments are deployed off of a, um, a, a, an, old, uh, an older bridge. And uh, what's one, one different piece of this deployment was that the deployment location is different from where the existing stream gauge is currently set up. So as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you need a separate power source, a separate data logger. Well, that's what we put in at this location. Uh, we put in a, two different solar panels to provide enough power to operate all the instruments. Again, we want to make sure there's always power so we don't have data loss occurring. We use a data logger uh, with cellular communication in it so that we can have remote access to this site. Um, and this is a site where we have two different deployment uh, uh, choices because some instruments are better suspended from the bridge and some are, um, need to be fixed to a rail. So we have uh, both the suspension style and rail deployment at this location to meet the different needs of our instrumentation. Uh, some of our smaller sites, what these look like, uh, these are locations where we utilize the uh, on-the-bottom type deployments where we have our SONs secured to the bottom using signposting. You can see a bilge pump installed on this monitor, and the monitor is inside of a um, PVC pipe. Again, we utilize some of that two-way communication I discussed earlier. And this is a location with a really uh, dynamic uh, stream bottom, so it's really sandy during certain large storm events. That bottom can change and move a lot, so we actually keep a couple different deployment locations installed at this site so we can quickly go out, unbury the sand, and move it to a different deployment location without too much extra work. Another one of these smaller uh, streams, 
Again, we're using this on the bottom approach, but in this example, we're not using a PVC tube because this instrument is more prone to sediment fouling. So this helps us preserve a higher quality record. And just a final slide here is um, serving the example that these are just um, these are just some basic or um, these are just some examples of the way instrumentation can be deployed. Uh, and what works best requires creativity, requires you to modify these approaches. Uh, and a project that we've recently started requires monitoring on headwater, uh, very small, shallow streams. So uh, the folks that put these instruments out took our existing deployment options of you know, working from the bridge and adapted a suspension style approach where there is no bridge. So you see an instrument hung between uh, cable suspended from some large trees or uh, off of an overhanging large tree limb. So this is all part of this being creative and adapting to your specific site needs. Uh, working on the bottom of the stream bed. Well, sometimes <laughs> there's a lot of bedrock on the bottom and you can't drive signposting in, uh, but you can secure the instrumentation to boulders or rock outcroppings, and this can be really useful um, to keep the instruments submerged in a really low profile type of deployment. Um, and again, since this is a new project, this is going to be, uh, these are going to be deployments that we modify and see, was this the right choice? Do we need to modify anything? Can, can it be improved in any way? And just a final um, add to this, one of the techniques that I've seen tried is uh, socks or netting. Um, sometimes we've added a, a netting around your in-situ water quality monitor to help keep out some aquatic life and critters and other things that, that like to live in and around our water quality monitors. Um, if you have great flow, uh, these socks sometimes work very well. But as we've shown with the PVC pipes, these socks or nettings can sometimes become a sediment trap. Again, some of the uh, tools that you utilize have to match your conditions. Um, in the coastal areas around Savannah, some of the guys, uh, Savannah, Georgia, um, some of the guys there have found that in coastal areas, wrapping their probes or instruments in copper wrapping or even using some anti-fouling paints have been successful. But again, we, we always caution that anytime you're utilizing some other product on your water quality monitor, you want to ensure that whatever that product is, is not going to affect the water chemistry that you're actually measuring. Um, but again, in those coastal areas, those guys have found that the SOP method or those nettings and the copper material all together ha have been successful. Um, in those areas, they, they were measuring conductance and temperature. Um, but if you are measuring some of the other parameters, such as turbidity, you might want to consider uh, using something other than the socks. But again, those tools uh, all helped us in our uh, goal of retaining as much data as possible, uh, prolonging our uh, maintenance schedule so that uh, the instruments are there longer um, and it reduces uh, uh, the amount of field visits that these instruments require. Um, the USGS has very defined techniques and methods for maintaining, operating, and calibrating water quality monitors. So we want to make sure that we're utilizing all the tools that we have to meet those methods, but also reducing the amount of energy and efforts that it's going to take to maintain these, these sensors in a very dynamic stream. Yeah. So I hope these, I hope these examples uh, just provided some information about you know, the objectives of our deployments. And, and really just reinforcing this idea that the way you maintain your deployment, the way you uh, refine your deployment really has a large impact on the data quality, uh, but can really result in a, a really valuable scientific information. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.